everybody. Oh, hey, there's a Doberman. We get to meet the Doberman. All right. All right. Troy. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll meet Troy later. We need to meet the dog. <laughs> Anzo, Anzo, come say hi. Come here. Hello. Oh, my goodness. Come say hi. You see, everybody, I bring on the quality guests. <laughs> Look at that gorgeous creature. Oh, good boy. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Good All right. Well, uh, this is everybody. This is Troy Goldberg. And I, if you've been hanging out in the chameleon world and only the chameleon world, you may not have run into him. He is in the dart frog world and has done a lot with the dart frog world. And so uh, we are going to be talking about dart frogs today because, as you all know, I believe every chameleon person should have at least one dart frog. That That's that's my policy. Hello, Troy. How's it going? Hey, how you doing, Bill? Good. Good. Uh, good afternoon. Or right. is it morning for you? Uh, for me, it is twelve noon. Just at noon. Yeah. Okay. And and oh, everybody. Oh, Kurt, so we do a lot of distractions here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like that. Come on. Oh, I got to show you. Got to show you my. This is this uh -huh. is Vixen. <laughs> uh -huh. And. And they're all excited because Hi. Yvette just came home. Hello. Hi, Yvette. Hi. <laughs> this is Troy. Hi, Troy. My, my <laughs> dark nice frog guru. Oh, cool. And there's Blazer, my, my Oops, favorite we gotta, boy. Got to meet Blazer. <laughs> he said, whatever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they thank, have froggy thank you toys. So much. <laughs> Come on, let's go play froggy toys. This is our deal. On, uh, I love it. On weekdays, I make coffee for her, bring her coffee in bed. And then on Saturdays for my show, she brings me coffee for my show. That's amazing. That's... I just I just uh, finished my coffee, my second coffee of the day. So all right, yep. So, woo. All right, let's go ahead and say hello to everybody in the chat there. Uh, oh my goodness, uh, Nate, Eliza, and Marsh, and James, uh, Richard, Sean, Mikey, Steve. Okay, we got all sorts of people here. Annabelle's here. Hey, Annabelle's going to be going to Madagascar with me. Oh, oh, that's cool. When are you going back? January. Oh, January 2025. And so, hey, we're going to bring bring a bunch of chameleon nerds with me and have a a, 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 conglu a conglomerate of a chameleon nerds. What we need a a, a, a Columinati, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. <laughs> I Everybody, like that. is that what you call a group of chameleon people? A Columinati? <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty awesome. I don't know. That's a shadowy organization. Uh, sure. Troy. Sure. I mean, you may not, uh, you, you don't, uh, there's been a lot of stuff going on, mysterious stuff going on that we don't understand with hooded oh, okay. people and stuff. And oh boy. I mean, it, it comes down to, I and mean, this is what it comes down to. Uh, you know, uh, you can't happen. see it very well. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, there's some stuff going on. I like it. Oh, all right. So, oh, Joanne says, uh, dart frogs were my previous passion until the spiders moved in to enjoy the fruit flies. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate, uh, unfortunate problem for most people that keep uh, anything that feeds on really small bugs. Well, this is a question. I, I, I don't have that problem of fruit flies getting out of the enclosure. If I have a little fruit cup, Yep. Uh, and and everybody, this is what I do for my baby chameleons. Uh, if I have hatchling chameleons, I don't want a cage that's fruit fly proof because I give a little little cup, deli cup of cup, deli cup of banana mash, and the fruit flies don't go anywhere. I, Troy, what's your experience on that? Uh, so I, you know, I think I kept it a, a lot more at bay when I was in my house since moving to the garage. Um, Seems like there's more spiders out here. So, um, and like I said, uh, well, I was telling you earlier that I'm some sometimes I'm lazy with putting fruit in the tank, and uh, yeah, there's flies that get out. And <laughs> I, as I explained to you earlier, I'm in the garage, so I don't really care. But it does present a lot of spiders. Um, but I I try to keep it at bay out here. By if I'm diligent, I'd say bi-weekly vacuuming of uh the i use the euro front design for my tanks and there's a little space where spiders love to hang out so i vacuum that area um i slide the light shields over and i vacuum that area as well i'm gonna i'm gonna let enzo out real quick he's okay. he's just crying right. repeatedly <laughs> yeah we can't have the doggy crying no, he's, <laughs> I, I'm just... oh hey Eurotech tuning 
Welcome, welcome. And uh, oh, and Eurotech, thank you very much for. Uh, if everybody saw the vlog this morning, Eurotech gave a nice long explanation of what he was doing uh, with uh, Knowles and Panther chameleons, and and just a. Uh, oh, and I'm going to interrupt here with <laughs> Troy. I just did a. Well, you and I did an interview about uh, doing a community tank uh, yep. back here with Frog, Gecko, and Chameleon, and so that, that's been a a fairly a spirited discussion in the sure. community as to. Well, number one, okay, you can do it, but does that mean everybody else can do it? And how are you being irresponsible for showing this? And uh, should you have uh, different different uh, creatures in there that are all from Madagascar? And, and and all very good discussion points. And so, sure, uh, I mean, and these things are absolutely things that we all need to talk about. Yeah. So, uh, a well, log talking about that. Yeah, that's I saw I saw your this morning I watched that. Oh. Um and uh yeah, I, I mean I think it'd be irresponsible if you just like shared a video of it without talking about any of the issues that could come like what you've what we had a conversation about and the things that you've been planning for. If you did didn't show that to the public and you just showed a video of Azurius with you know, satanic leaf tail geckos and carpet chameleons and just like put a random like reel up on YouTube or, uh, you know, on Instagram or anything, then I'd say that is painting a picture and kind of promoting it to just anybody to see it and think, oh, I can keep these things together. But the fact that you have made some videos and gone over, you know, and, you know, talk about the actual planning and knowing the certain habitats of each animal like i think you're doing it the right way and that's what i i mean i say the same things when you know because i have uh i've had cohab tanks with certain tree frogs and glass frogs and dark and you know and people are like you can't mix them I'm like you can though like the, the things i have are not pot that it's not possible for them to interbreed or crossbreed or hybridize and their habitats and some feed at night some feed in the day. like i go you know and i make videos as well going over that um, but ultimately, you know, I think people that go to zoos and see these mixed cohab tanks uh, that have no intention of, you know, knowing they're going to be in the hobby, you know, I think those are worse, you know, yeah. and, than people like us on YouTube or Instagram. Yeah. And, that, and, that, and uh, and I was, there was a difficult discussion about the comment section. And and I, after looking at it, I, I'm I'm not happy with how I portrayed it. I I should have, I, I should what what I would, should have said is that the people read the comments and they they get encouragement from the comments. And the problem with the comments is they are very short, and so you don't have the the time to, I mean, people making the comments can't make, don't have the time and space to explain all the planning that they did. Exactly. And so it's like, I have to go in and say, okay, there's a lot of planning that goes on to this. And, uh, and, and I said something about, okay, if you're making the comments, explain what you're doing. I, I think in, what I really wanted to say is make sure people don't read your comment and say, okay, it's that easy. Right. And, and and it's I know it's tough. It's tough uh, to write everything in a small comment. And then me, I have to come back later and say, OK, I'm ultimately responsible for this because they're going to say I went to his video uh, and they don't watch the video. They just read the comments. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's part of it. You know, sometimes you, you post a video going over everything that you need to go over and plan for something like that. And a lot of the times the viewer skips through that and goes right to the most popular point in the video, which is the unveiling of the tank and the animals. And they just see that and they go, Oh, I can do that. And it's like, well, I put it in the video. You just decided not to watch yeah, the yes. important steps of that, you know, but <laughs> just, and it goes, it comes back on you always. And it's like, well, what do you want well, me to do? I want to say, everybody, please keep commenting. I love the interaction and the discussion. This is just a very difficult, thing to work with because it's so controversial and people can just take it oh, oh my they do they go to petco they grab three animals and they throw it together in a too small cage and say yeah, yeah they're happy it's like yep. oh you can't i can't be responsible for that so, right <laughs> anyway. 
I oh, okay. totally get that. Uh, this is Stephanie. Stephanie is uh, fangirling all over. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad I, that we could help you <laughs> with building yeah, and, barbariums. And I would say, uh, I, and I echo what Stephanie is saying. If you all want to see how to do awesome enclosures and what awesome ones look like, Troy Goldberg's YouTube channel. It's Troy Goldberg's Garage. Is that the official uh, name? Troy, I, I don't even know. I, <laughs> I think it's. I think it's. Troy Goldberg's Tropical Garage. I couldn't remember if it was Troy Goldberg or just Troy's. I may have switched it because I thought about switching in a couple. Uh, but, you know, I think I posted, like, the last video I posted was probably, like, six months ago. So I'm not too uh, too active on there. He's not a rabid YouTuber. He's just a dart frogger who happens to uh, hang out on YouTube. Occasionally I'll post some videos. Yes. I just really, like, I don't know. I've talked to Mike, Mike Titula about it. You know, he's like, why don't you just post more, like, post weekly? I'm like because i don't want to like mm -hmm. I, I don't want to force content like you know it, i feel like a lot of times when i when people do the the weekly post on the same thing over and over and over it's like you kind of tune out sometimes and i don't want to just be creating to to create i want to create when i feel like it's something that's necessary to share or i find important to share with uh, the hobby you know there is a huge difference between being a hobbyist that does YouTube videos and being a YouTuber. Yes. And there are serious decisions that you have to make if you become a YouTuber. Yep. And there's you need to learn different skills. You need to commit to the YouTube culture if you want to be successful. Yep. And that and I just just uh recently, 2 months ago, not even two months ago, made that transition to where okay. I used to be a podcaster. That was my main thing. Yeah. And I've realized that there's been such a convergence of technologies that now video podcasting is the thing. Audio yep. podcasting isn't, isn't growing. And yeah. so I had yeah. to make the jump to not just pushing stuff on YouTube, but actually becoming a, a youtuber making this a main platform outreach yeah yeah and yeah no it makes sense like i get it totally get it and you know i considered doing stuff like that um but ultimately like whenever i would i get like a little hot streak and i'll post three or four in a row like uh -huh. what i'm doing when i start editing like when i edit those first two videos i'm like i love this this is great this is fun i'm liking it and then towards the end of editing the third video i'm like ah. I'm like rushing to get it out. And I feel like there's parts that I'm like, whatever, I got to throw it up. I'm just going to throw it up, even though it's not where I want it to be. And then the fourth and coming from an art background, like that's not how I do my art. Like when I make art, like I'm not done till it's done and or till I think it's done. And so I have it's a problem for me when like when I get to that fourth video and it's like you're like sort of burning out. And, you know, especially during certain times of the year when I'm busy with my actual job, like. I just can't, I, I can't do it. So then I, but just like anything, you know, if you go to the gym for five months straight and you take three days off, you may start taking four weeks off mm -hmm. five weeks off. It's like, so those, when I say I'm going to take a few weeks off making videos, it turns into six, seven months. Cause I'm yeah. just like, you know, yeah. you get out of it. But uh, you know, a lot of times people ask like, are you just done making videos? Like, no, I'll, I'll make a video when I, I'm working on a couple right now, actually. Um, so, I should be posting in a couple of weeks. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll look forward to seeing that. Yeah. Um, I know in my, the only, I actually was not able to do the weekly thing. It just never, it, it just never worked for me. I tried it, but coming down and doing a daily vlog has clicked and yeah. it just, this is uh, where I love being. It's yeah. like, it's a rush and, uh, and it's, yeah. I, I'm loving doing a daily vlog. Yeah, no, I like that. And, you know, if I considered doing that a couple of years ago, too, and I'm like, but it it's it would get so repetitive for me out here. Like people are always like, you should do a vlog of like your maintenance on the day. And I'm like, it may only be three minutes. <laughs> I may go in and just feed the tanks real quick. And I may not be in the, the frog rooms for the rest of the day because like, it's all you know, kind of self-automated. I don't I'm, like, I'm not doing the same thing out here, but I you know you, you're, 
it's nice to listen to you talk too. I I don't like the sound of my voice, okay. and I like <laughs> I like I like ramble on, and uh, and my voice is like kind of monotone. It's not very exciting. Like I don't have. <laughs> Mike always makes fun of me because my YouTube voice is like very, very like putting me to sleep, man. I'm like, I, what do you want me to do? That's how I talk. But, so, yeah. all right. Well, okay. So we've been sitting here talking uh, shop, uh, uh, creator shop here, and uh, we, we need to bring in the audience here who wants to talk about dart frogs <laughs> and uh, see. Here, I can. I can you. Yeah, 300 gallon paludarium. Hand this around. There it is. Wow, that is amazing. It's doing well. I just uh, added a bunch of fish in there. Uh, this like black thing on the side is actually just to block my uh, my resin heater. It's like super, super um, uh, hot. <laughs> so when I sit on the couch, I try to like deflect the air away. But I just added a bunch of fish to the bottom. Um, and I removed a really large bromelia that was kind of like eating up the whole center of this tank. Um, so yeah, I'm enjoying it. There's, uh, Cruzio hylocraspidopus in there, tree frogs, and, uh, they're nocturnal. So, uh, relatively, well, no, I, let me, let me rephrase, incredibly boring diurnal animals. <laughs> um, so that's why the fish is a nice little, um, you know, in the daytime I come out here in the morning and I, I give them some, some little, I've got some cardinal tetras, um, some forktail rainbow fish. I have some panda quarries and some orange Venezuelan quarries and ember tetras. There's a, a ton of fish in there. So um, that's been fun as of late. I've got some shrimp in there as well. But um, yeah, so that's where I sit on the couch and I try to block that heat away. But yeah, so I have the tree frogs in there, no dart frogs in there. Uh, and then, the, yeah, the fish. So it's, okay. uh, it's fun. It's doing well. Let's talk about UVB. What what's going on in your community? <laughs> You're asking me. <laughs> no, there's there's not many of us uh, in the dart frog hobby using UVB. I personally do. Um, there's a couple others that are primarily into obligates. Some people use them on small obligates. Mostly people use them with large obligates. And what's um, an obligate? That is Uf the Ufaga genus. They the it, it literally means um, egg feeder or egg eater. So the it's a it's a type of dart frog where the tadpoles will not develop unless they eat trophic infertile eggs laid by. Doesn't have to be the mother, but um, like you can use surrogate eggs from another another female histrionica or pamilio. But uh, that's a whole a whole other thing that some some people do successfully. But um, you know we're like the dendro babies. You know, you can raise them on fish food and bloodworms and whatever. Fruit flies, you know, the tadpoles will eat anything. Algae, algae wafers. The, the Ufaga tadpoles will eat that stuff, but they don't develop. They never develop. So they need, there's like a certain number of eggs they need to, to eat to develop the limbs and develop correctly. So, um, yeah. Um and people have noticed that with them, and personally, I have as well. I've tried UVB on dendrobates. I've tried it on phyllobates. I've tried it with my Ufaga pamilio. The only frogs I've noticed that actually seek out the UVB are the Histrionica, Lamani, and Sylvatica, which are considered the large obligates because pamilio and um, like Vicentii and um, Granulifera, granulifera are kind of like a medium size, but still considered on the small end of Ufaga. I know some people use the UVB with them still, um, but I, I tried it and I never noticed them ever going to that light. Um, and the way I was kind of able to tell that frogs were seeking it out um, was a little bird lamp I used to use. Uh, it was maybe like this big. You know, six, seven inches, and I put it inside the tank. And so it's not lighting up the whole tank. It's literally just a small little area. And frogs would not be in front of that light. And then I'd come back 20 minutes later and I'd see them sitting like, you know, 10 to 15 inches in direct light of that, you know, just right in front of the light. So, and it was almost like they were in a, a trance, so to speak. Um, they just like sat there. I'm like, hey, like I'm like getting close, like what are you alive? And they're just like, ah, <laughs> they like spooked them. They were just like in a trance. So, um, and I know people that have seen them in the wild. 
sitting in absolute direct light, little patches of direct light penetrating through the canopy and onto the forest floor that they have found all dart frogs. Are. Like Mike Novi was telling me that, you know, he's, he's, he saw a uh, Pamilio and a Rodis literally like three inches apart on the ground. Like, and there was a, another frog, I forget what it was, but there was little, three little frogs in one small, small area of direct sunlight. And they were just sitting there like soaking it up. Um, and he like, he was, when he was down there in Costa Rica, he like, was nerding out with his temperature probes and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And he said it was like really, it was hot, like where they were sitting in the direct sunlight. Like it was close to 100 degrees. Like you said, it was very hot where they were sitting. So, okay. yeah. You know, we've got a bunch of chameleon people here. Let's go ahead and take it really high level. Say we just walk into the dart frog community. Could you give us a just a brief tour of? All of these words, phylobates, dendrobates, uh, uh, what what are we looking at when we walk into this hobby? Okay, so dendrobates are considered to be more of your, they're large, um, pretty bold, um, they, they're out a lot. Um, you're talking Tinctorius, Aratus, Leucomelis, um, those are the most popular dendrobates that you're going to find in the hobby. Um, and, you know, there's several different morphs and locales of each of those. Um, some are, you know, naturally occurring, some are trait bred and they consider them a, a morph, but really it's just a, it's a lime bred frog. Um, and so those frogs are also pretty easy to breed and they are, generally on the cheaper end of the spectrum because we can raise their tadpoles and we can raise, you know, on a pair of frogs, you could raise easily a hundred to 200 babies in a year where on the opposite end with the Ufaga, like I said, we can't raise them because I'm not, you know, I don't have trophic eggs to give them. So generally the females are in charge of how many they raise up in the bromeliads and they may only raise up three to four frogs every three to four months, sometimes every 12 months. So it's considerably less um, supply to feed that demand for them. So that's why they are on the higher spectrum of money um, or cost, I should say. Um, Phyllobates are, there's several species of those as well. Uh, I'd say the most popular or most famous is the, um, I say terribilis, but some people say terribilis. It's that is the most toxic dart frog, and where the whole dart frog name itself comes from is them. Um, a lot of the other dart frogs will not. If you get their poison in your bloodstream, you will not die. You may get sick and vomit and stuff like that. But the if you touch, and this is all wild, I'm talking because they don't sequester that toxin in captivity. Um, but so all those frogs in the wild, if you were to get their toxin in your bloodstream, you'd be fine, but probably be a little sick for a little while. But, um, and I say a little while, like a couple hours, not like weeks, but, um, the terribilis, if, if you're in the wild and you have a cut on your hand, or if you touch one and then bite your fingernails and you get that any residual toxin, cause it's just on their skin. Um, if you get that in your bloodstream, like you're, you're, you're done. Like you're, you're not surviving that. Um, it's extremely toxic um, or toxic or poisonous. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> <It worked. laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and they're bigger frogs. The follow are, are similar size to the um, tinctorious, the dendrobates tinctorious, but they get more robust and they also eat significantly larger food. Um, they'll eat half inch crickets like no problem where a tinctorious won't even look at a half inch cricket, like wouldn't even consider eating it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something it's interesting. You know, they, the, the ter terribilis will actually like the food will be hanging out of their mouth and they'll shove it in there like they're <laughs> they're uh, ravenous eaters, I'll say. Um, really cool frogs. Um, uh, so that's those two genuses. Um, and then, you know, the Ufaga, the Pamilio are really small frogs, really loud call. Um, they're native to Panama, Costa Rica, 
um, Nicaragua, but uh, a lot of them are, come from the Bocos del Toro islands, and it's kind of cool. Every island you go to, the one island may have green and yellow, and the other island may be all red and white, and then the next island may be all blue. So they, it's you don't find a whole like you don't find the you're not going to find the red frogs on the green island like that won't that's not going to happen like the green island is uh Bocos del Colón and Bastimento is like they're two different islands and it's kind of cool how the the sea or the, the ocean separates them um but they're small really cool frogs again they're obligates so they you don't get a whole lot of them when you breed them um and then the larger histrionica and sylvatica those are down in Colombia Ecuador um and um they're loud that's probably if you can hear in the background that's what you know, that wah, 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 wah. that's them they make a we call it like a, a little quacking or it's like a little duck calling but um noisy um big bold frogs and i specify this because sometimes people always say like well the tinks and stuff are the boldest right and yes and no um when you're feeding like if you feed the tanks and someone comes over they're going to see the tinks. The tinks are out. They're just mm -hmm. right out in the middle. They're eating. But if I open the door to take a picture, they, they get skittish and they like, they, they like won't sit still when I try to take pictures of them. Now the histrionica, while they might not be out in the open as much, I still see mine all the time, but they're usually like, they're doing stuff like they're courting and they're tending tads and the males calling and telling the female to go here and feed this tadpole. They're like doing stuff. But um, now if I, if one is out in the open and I slide the door open, I mean, I can get right up in its face and it's just like, like, hi, they don't <laughs> care. They're very, very bold in that regard, especially as adults. Sometimes people will message me and be like, I thought you said these are bold. I never see mine. I'm like, well, it's a five month old. It hasn't developed yet. Give it some time. And when they're adults, they're just yeah, insanely bold for me. Well, the wonderful thing about, I love about the dart frogs that I've kept is their call and I, I had a mint triblis and every time that thing would start up at the other end of the house everybody would hear it and mm -hmm. everybody in unison no matter what room they were or they're in they would be frogger <laughs> it was a fun thing in my house yeah um, they've got so a noisy call if we enjoy the uh the song of the dart frogs uh which ones would you say have the most beautiful call Mm. I do like the Terabilis call. I think that's nice. Um, but I think prettier it's may maybe is the uh, Leucomelis. Um, it's a little, it's, it's very similar to the, and I have my Leucomelis right next to my Terabilis. So their calls are very similar, but it's almost like the Leucomelis is a little higher and a little softer. It's like not as uh, brash, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, so I'd say they have a nice little call. The Ufaga's calls all sound. I, I love it. I love it. But I would say it's not pretty because it, it's almost like they're barking at you. Like, bah, 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 bah. They're like it's very like an aggressive call. Um, uh -huh. Now, I'd say the coolest call is a frog that I no longer keep because the frogs were so I'm not big on shy frogs. And these were insanely shy for me. Um, uh, the coolest call, I think, is the Olibates Zaparo. Um, Holobates? That's all actually, babies. All I've babies. Not heard of that genus. They're not very popular um, in the hobby. There's, I, I can think of, I think there's all babies from femoralis. Um, there's all babies Zaparo. I don't know what else because they're typically not the most colorful. The Zaparo are though. They're like red and blue, and they're really granular. Um, like their skin texture is really granular. They're they're really really beautiful frogs and a really cool call, but they're like lightning fast and um very shy and um i decided they didn't make the cut so i recently got rid of them about uh two months ago and uh yeah, it it made my room a little more organized as well i have like a little ocd i think and my bottom row is all dendro babies and i had all dendro babies and then i had all the babies on the bottom and now i have all dendro babies again <laughs> but the mid levels all large obligates the top levels like all small obligates but um <clears throat> yeah the uh the call was uh, i had a real hard time deciding between the uh the tribulus the lucamelas and the azurius but since i do a lot of video recording in this room 
the uh, the Azurius one out because uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> very quiet. Most of the time, people don't even know that the, like the frogs like calling. Whisper. Yeah, it's a very small like little buzz, and it's, it's like not strong. Sometimes that buzz is like it like cracks as they're trying to get it out. And the best way to know your frog's calling is to visually see it because they puff their sides up and they like expel yeah. their whole body. It, is the is the sound just above our hearing range? No, I mean I because you can hear it. Yeah, but they oh. in, the, in the forest floor. How do they hear each other unless it's that? I that's a good good question. I I don't know enough about that. <laughs> there would have to be somebody that's got more of a science background than me, uh, and and have a good idea about that. But I mean, it's possible. But when I when I see mine call, um, I mean I I hear the whole way through. It's just like a. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> all I know is I don't have to stop recording when the Azurias go at it. That's true. I was also going to say uh, another really pretty call are like the Ranitamea, like imitators. And it's, okay. it's a really, it's a quick little, it's like a, it's like a mini, uh, I don't know. I guess it's not, a, it's, it's a unique call, but uh, they have a nice, a really high pitched call, but it is loud. Um, but what's nice about them as opposed, it's similar to the Tinks, in, is that call may only last one to two seconds, and then there's a pause. And then okay. maybe 20 or 30 seconds later, it may be another two-second call where, like, you know, the, the Terribilis the, and the the Ufaga, some, my, some of my Ufaga will literally call barking like that for three minutes straight. It's like, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have... What supplements do you use and how often? Wow. Um, it changes for me, but um, primarily I'm using Rapashi Calcium Plus as my main calcium feeder. Um, and I rotate between that and then DendroCare and then Rapashi Vitamin A. So if I feed three times a week, I say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, all those feedings, though, I do mix with. Uh, naturals carotenoid supplement. Um, so I'm feeding that like every single time. Um, it's good for a lot of things, but primarily color, obviously, with the carotenoids and um, eggs, breeding, overall general health. I've noticed. Um, so yeah, I use that every time. But sometimes if I run out of my Repassion Calcium Plus, then I have calcium from um tink man herps it's a website he sells his own calcium on there um or else i'll even use uh repto cal occasionally which i'm pretty sure is like oh, kind of looked down upon as like a kind of a garbage calcium but uh, i've talked to several people in the dart frog community that have really good results with it so i have it on hand but it's not my main calcium source okay all right how long is the general lifespan for a dart frog Mm, mm. it depends on the husbandry obviously um the longest i've i think actually right now my, i've had my yellow backs for 16 years um and they're still breeding and it's a dendrobate extinctorious yellow backs um they're still breeding and still having viable offspring but i, I think the longest recorded in captivity is uh either 28 or 32 years or something like that. So it's pretty much double of what I've got right now. Um, and I'm pretty sure there, it was like a pair of Luke's or possibly Azurius, but they, yeah, we're still breeding it till the time that, you know, that you can tell they start to just like anything else, not look like they're in their prime. Um, they're not as robust and they just kind of look old. I can tell that when I have that with, um, so I, I don't know the, and it also depends on, the species too like we said we're talking dendrobates those are both the longest recorded to my knowledge um with a lot of the pamilio i have i notice about 10 to 12 years they start so they start looking rough and then they'll just disappear one day and you know luckily i have offspring and they, that i can raise up and use them to, as, as breeders but um because because one of the things with a lot of the ufaga that that's in the hobby uh, like the Pamilio, a lot of them were 
imported from strictly reptiles or um, simply natural dart frogs. Like, so these were importers back in, you know, the 2006 to 2012 era. And a lot of those frogs that came in then, you know, you don't know how, cause that's not, those weren't farm raised. Sometimes they were labeled as that, but they were just, mm-hmm. they're just, they're just imports. Um, so you don't know how old those frogs are. You know, they could be, it could be an eight-year-old wild-caught adult, or it could be a two-year-old wild-caught adult, or it could be a 12-year-old wild. You have no idea. Um, so, but I've noticed on a lot of the the import stuff that I had, I didn't have much, but it, it seemed about 10 to 12 years. They would just start slowly creeping off and not looking good, and no changes were made to the enclosure or parameters or food or anything like that. So you know, I don't know if it's because so much um, – their bodies are used for so much, especially the females producing that many eggs to feed the, the tadpoles all the time where, you know, they're constantly producing eggs. I don't know if that's what it is, but yeah, it just seems like their parental role is vastly more important than a dendrobates or phyllobates or other genuses of dart frogs because they're, they rely on the, the parents. So I don't know if that's what it is, but. Okay. Are these frogs escape artists or do they stay in their enclosure? (laughs) If they can get out, they'll get out, especially like a recently set up tank. Like you put a frog in a recently set up tank, they're looking to get out. They're looking to explore. Um, I've had times where I've left the door open in like two inches or so, but after the frogs have been in the tank for a year or two years and I come out the next morning and I'm like, oh crap. And they're just sitting in the tank. So it's like if if they're exploring and looking around, they don't they're not familiar with the tank and they haven't found their little spots they like to be in, then yeah, they'll they'll get out. Um and but they don't always, it's not like for the life of the frog, it's gonna constantly be looking to get out. It's not like that. But um I, I as a as a safe rule of measure, I always say. Make sure that they can't get out of that tank. <laughs> Make sure there's no small gaps, yep. uh, you know, depending on the size of the frog, too. But. All right, Bill, why did you choose a Zurius over a Madagascar native like Mantellas or Michael Reed frogs? Are there care differences or is it personal preference? I uh, I chose, I, I'd like to say I, I looked at the relative sizes and decided that the Azurias would, would be bigger than the Mantellas and therefore be a safer uh, uh a participant in the community but the truth is i love azurius more than anything else and thus that's why i chose it and it, it was the size that that would work and the the call would not interfere with my other video and <laughs> podcast recording but uh, it's mainly because i love azurius and anything else would be oh, okay i'll do this because it's madagascar but nope nope I said, nope, I got to do Azurius. There is no, there is no other. As I say, my love for Azurius may be forbidden, but Azurius is my Juliet. And it's your tank, so you should be able to, as long as they're healthy and they're going to survive, then you should be able to do what you want. Yeah, and and really looking at that that uh, uh, that biome uh, biotope back there. There's the only thing that is consistent is that two of them, co- coincidentally, the carpet chameleon and the fantasticus come from Madagascar, but everything else in there comes from the New World, Southeast Asia. I mean, we're, we're talking about plants as well. If we're going to be going yeah. consistent with a biotope, we, we got to look at the plants as well. And uh, there, there's just so much variety back there. I have all sorts of respect for the extreme sports for pediculturists that go for biomes with the same kind of plants, the same kind of uh, substrate consistency as with the animals, but that's not what I am doing. And so uh, um, yeah, it really, carpet chameleon and fantastic is both being from Madagascar. That's just coincidence. And even if I did do a mantella, they'd be in a bio, uh, bio uh, an environment that comes from all over the world so i it's not a it's not a priority and there really isn't there there really isn't an advantage to doing a mantella just because it's from the same land mass because 
I went to Madagascar. I saw carpet chameleons, Fantasticus, and Mantellas in their natural environment. They're not going to see each other. Those are vastly different. <laughs> and so there's no like connection just because they're on the same axis. There's no other connection that makes it advantageous to have Mantellas over the, the Azurias. Um, although I'm always I'm always open to learning. If if somebody says, okay, but what about this? Then okay, I, I I'm open for the discussion. But you know, they come from three different areas. The, the Mantellas were by the uh, the creek side, and the carpet chameleons were by the roadside, and the uh, the Fantasticus was in the deeper forest. So they they don't know each other. Yeah, I know nothing about uh, Mantella habitats. I've never kept them. Um, I don't know anything about their their temperature, humidity, breeding, nothing. I, like I know literally, it, it's a uh, it's not a genus I've ever, the type of frog I've ever really cared to explore. I guess I know they just don't do it for me. So you know, <laughs> teach their own, right? Yeah. <laughs> and here's a um, here's a, another thing. Very good points about the plants. It's very very difficult to source a variety of plants from Madagascar. There's two other things to consider. So many of the animals in Madagascar are actually on invasive introduced plants because there's been so much deforestation over there. I mean, you see Lantana, that's from Southeast Asia, I believe, all over the place. And uh, and so, I mean, they don't even get to be in their own biotope. Um, and then uh, the source of plants from Madagascar, if I went and I tried to, uh, like the plants that I found the Fantasticus on, I mean, these are just tall trees and like branch masses in between. There's no way that I could reproduce that uh, effectively using those species in uh, in captivity. So I, I think another one challenge with doing the biotope uh, approach is that it's very difficult to recreate, even if you have the same species, you're not creating that species at the age and size that your chameleon or gecko is using it. So there, there's a lot to this extreme sport of biotope creation. Uh, I've tried. Think. I've tried to do a couple like biotopes and I ended up getting a little too frustrated because <laughs> it was just like, it, it gets, it gets ridiculous. Like certain how, how specific people want to get with it. And it's like, eh, Okay, I'm done. <laughs> and and it may be a little bit easier if you're doing it with a terrestrial animal. Oh yeah. But if I, I'm arboreal, I love arboreals, and uh, the thing is, we're taking a snapshot of something that's six meters, three six meters up in the air, and yep. how do I recreate that? Yep. In here, so we have Difficult. an added challenge. Yep. Uh, let's see. What makes an environment more enriching for them as in objects to jump off of or plants to explore and hide in? Is that frogs or? Yeah, yeah. How do we make oh. our frogs happy? Um, I, I really just try and tell people, um, you know, like a long time ago when people would have dart frogs, they'd put substrate down and put some plants in the ground and that's it. No background or anything like that. Even if you did a background and it's just a flat background, it doesn't really do anything. Um, surface area is kind of huge. So when I do backgrounds, I try to make angles of like with wood and then I foam in between the wood and the background to kind of make up like a whole plane that's basically new levels for them to go to. So if I have a 20 gallon enclosure and I have the whole the sides and the back done and i've got all these planes it turns into not a 20 gallon enclosure it's probably closer to a 35 gallon enclosure because of you're basically having like it's like a double decker tank there's a lot more surface area for them to go to um so what it helps with is i don't know about enriching um you know but uh relieving stress and frogs being able to get away from one another that if maybe they're not getting along it can kind of go away and go to a, a different level of the tank. Obviously, if it's you want the other frogs being really aggressive, it can chase it around, and you may have to 
intervene and break them up. But um, I wouldn't say more items to jump off uh, or explore necessarily. Hide, yeah, potentially. Um, but just having more surface area that's not just like, you know, when people say they're terrestrial animals, not just a flat ground and plants. A flat ground with lots of levels and um, just surface area for the frogs to go to. That's what I try to do. Um, and I try to create. And some of the pieces of wood, you know, I, I, I sometimes I get it's hard for me to explain because I do things more more so for primarily uh, breeder tanks. So there's things you want to do for when you're breeding and it's different for when you're doing setting something up for a display. Um, but generally with breeding tanks, you want to have with certain frogs, you need to have basically like a almost like a walk the plank type of deal. Like you let, it's good to have certain pieces of wood protruding out um, that the frog, a male frog can go to that and be at the highest point and present his call. Um, but also it's good for him to be able to, if he wants to recede into the and go away and kind of hide in the background, he can do that as well. Um, it's a, it's a kind of a balance you have to try to do. And it's, it's nearly impossible for me to just explain that or even show in videos of me doing backgrounds. Don't really, I'm sure if you've, you've probably seen some vivariums in person that it's significantly different from when you see it on a video or a picture. You can't really get all the three dimensional aspects of it from just a video and a picture. It's you almost have to see it in person to, to understand the depth that a tank may have for that animal. Well, that's the biggest change that I am going to be doing. Let's see if I can get that up here. So with this, as wonderful as it is, this area, I want to take out this plant here and create a, a more of a mound here on this side of the, uh, of the enclosure so the dart frogs can hop up on there. And I'll, I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to make it out of, but yeah, uh, I'll, I'll give them more surface there. Um, I would try, I would use, so I, trying to think of something lightweight and permanent um have you ever messed around with like the cork flats um like they use them for like i think they use them for sound insulation or maybe yeah, awesome yeah. yeah so it's like that i get them from zorro but um that stuff holds up really well and you could probably just kind of carve a mountain out of it um or a, just a hillside and kind of have that up against the background plants will root into it and grow up it. Um, or the other material I really like to use is like a, is a sponge bat, like filter sponge. I use that for all kinds of stuff, filling in voids. Um, and then I foam over top of it and I press the foam into it. So it creates more of a permanent structure there. But, um, those are both two, two good materials to, uh, build up surface area. Cause if you just use substrate, or something natural that'll break down that mound you're going to have to keep adding to it it's going to be there and then it's going to slowly degrade and you have to build it up again which you know was always a problem for me 10 15 years ago when i built a tank and i wanted to make like levels in the tank and i did that with substrate it looked really cool at first and then a year down the road now the levels were all yeah. flat and so i'd have to do it again i've used great stuff foam before how does that rate I use it all the time. I use the black. I like the yeah, black great stuff. Because, green. Yeah. 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 No, it's not even that. It's actually just called uh multi-purpose. Multi-purpose oh. black great stuff. Is <laughs> it's not just uh pond and pond and stone or whatever anymore. Yeah, pond and stone, that's it. Yeah. They still sell that, but I just use I get the uh multi-purpose black off Amazon. So okay. um yeah, I really like that. And so yeah, that's what I was talking about, like with the the, the filter sponge. I don't have a piece handy, but um, yeah, I ordered these like sheets of filter sponge and, you know, you can, it can carve really easy with, um, you know, the extendable snap blades that everyone uses to carve foam and stuff like that. It carves that stuff really easy. You can carve it into shape. And then if you wanted to like secure it to your background or wherever, you could put great stuff over that. And then immediately when you're done spraying, spray the great stuff with water and wait about 10 minutes 
and it'll be soft and pliable, but not sticky. And you can okay. kind of press you can press the foam into the the sponge mat, and it'll kind of make a really hard surface and a permanent surface um, that once you're happy with the shape will stay that shape forever. So yeah, you can use that too. Um, but obviously if you're making a mountain of just great stuff with no, basically the, the uh, sponge mat would be sort of the skeleton or the yeah. frame of that mountain. And if you're just doing that without the foam, you're going to be battling a lot because you're going to spray the foam and it's going to sag and you're going to spray oh, yeah, the foam. Yeah, and it's gonna sag. <laughs> it yeah. So you got to build like some sort of mountain or a skeleton or yeah. skeleton or frame to it. And that's why I think the, uh, Sponge mat's really good because it's, you know, people use it for filters and it's not going to, it's non-toxic or anything like that. Um, and it's really lightweight, you know, so, and, it, and it'll hold up to that foam. So really okay. easy to manipulate and carve. How are dart frogs when it comes to vacations? Do they need daily care or can you get away for a long weekend? Oh, you can definitely get away for a long weekend. I, I'm, I'm a little crazy about like a week away, but I've gone away for a week. Um, but you know, it's it's. I have the my my situation's pretty self automated. All the lights are on timers. Uh, the misting system is on a timer, and my I just recently. That's one of the videos I'm going to be doing in the next couple of weeks. Is I just switched my RO unit, my reverse osmosis water, to direct into the misting system, so I don't even have a reservoir anymore. It's just. RO to a pressure tank, the pressure tank to the, so I will never have to fill the reservoir. It's always going to have fresh RO water going to the misting. Um, those are the two most important things um, besides food. And if your enclosures are set up properly, there's more than likely going to be several different types of microfauna or bioactive components. Um, you'll have springtails, isopods, any little tiny mites and bugs that the frogs will eat if you're gone. Um, but being that I am a breeder and I like to have my frogs always stay fat and healthy and not go through a, you know, a week long period of no fruit flies and I don't hire someone to come take care of my animals. I don't really trust them. Um, so sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually just take a fruit fly culture that's already previously boomed the initial boom and, but it's still producing flies. And I'll just put the whole culture in the tank for a week and mm -hmm. let them have at it and come back, take the culture out, and we're back in action. So for me, it's all pretty much self-automated. But for somebody that just gets one tank and if they don't have a misting system and they uh, don't have a ton of microfauna set up or, you know, established in the tank, yeah, you they, they need daily misting for sure. Um, although it also depends on your enclosure how much ventilation your enclosure has. If you've got a screen top, like a full screen top, you're going to need to mist multiple, several times a day. If you've got a solid glass top and pretty much no ventilation, I don't recommend that, but it can be done. Um, you may only need to mist once every three days because it basically is locking in all that moisture. So all that stuff comes into play, which each person would have to dial in on what they've, what their, you know, personal situation has to, you know, what they have to do. All right. What is a Santa Isabel? They are a very uh, prolific, <laughs> prolific breeding dart frog. Uh, I do not have any of them. I've never actually kept them, but some are pretty cool. Um, they are, why can I think of the genus? Uh, Anthonia is the, is the species name. Um, I can't think of the, the genus right now of, of they're a small dart frog with a very loud call okay. um, and they call pretty much all the time and they breed all the time and their value has gone down significantly because there's just so many of them. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there are, they are Epipitabates, I believe. Epipitabates Antonia. Yes, that's what they are. Okay. It's a, another type of dart frog. Um, people call them Epips. A lot of people say it wrong. They say epitabates, but it's epipitabates. <laughs> it's epip. Um, so yeah, uh, they are. Um, they're cool. You know. You know. I don't know much about them as far as keeping them. Um, I know they're very hardy, and probably a good 
good beginner dart frog. I usually recommend Leucomelus for beginners. I think Leucomelus are probably the easiest and most hardy frog for anybody that's never kept dart frogs. Um, they do well in groups. They call similar to the Epipetabates anthonii. They call and do well in groups and breed relatively easy. So, um, yeah, that's okay. what they are. <laughs> well, that segues into this next very important question. I love this. Any first-timer mistakes you could warn us against? What aren't we asking? So many, so many. Um, <laughs> I'd say, well, as a as a as a hobbyist, what you're going to want to avoid is um, trying to hybridize dart frogs, because you will get a significant backlashing from the majority of the of the other hobbyists. So it'll just be bad. So that's, I'd say, like. As an unwritten rule, there's no rules in the hobby, but it are no laws, I should say. But that's kind of an unwritten rule that you don't want to crossbreed, you don't want to hybridize, you don't want to do anything. Like that. So, first time mistake, just don't get a bunch of tinks, and then when you get eggs, get excited, take those eggs okay. and throw throw them out. <laughs> um, honestly, that's the most responsible thing to do. There's a whole reason we could go into, but um, I'm going to try and stick to the question. I tend to wander off, but uh, mistakes in terms of keeping frogs, the husbandry, um, using tap water. Um, if you don't know, you know, some people's water is really harsh and um, it's, it's not advisable to use it. You want to use reverse osmosis or distilled water for dart frogs, um, not deionized. You just want to use RO and distilled. You can use aged tap water, um, or you can use the tap water that you've treated with like black water extract and stuff like that. You can use that for misting and water bowls. If you have water bowls in your tanks, you can use that. But um, that's a pretty common thing that some people do. Um, other than that, keeping your tank too wet, like I was saying earlier, I don't advise using a full glass top with no ventilation. Um, cause if you do over mist it and the tank gets too wet, the ground gets too saturated. The frogs can get, they're very prone to bacterial infections and fungal infections. And it usually comes from the tank being too wet. Um, so that's a problem. Another problem is keeping your tank too dry. Um, frogs can do fine in 50, 60% humidity. Um, not much lower than that though. Uh, it starts to get a little scary if they don't have a water source to get to. That could be a little scary there. Um, but people's plants die, and they're like, "Why are all my plants dying?" And I see the tank, and I'm like, "It's bone dry. You gotta, you gotta keep it. It's gotta be kind of humid. You don't want it." And it's, that's hard to explain to somebody that's a first timer. It's hard to tell them they like the tank really humid. That person thinks, "Okay, my tank's got to be soaking wet." But I always say in the same sentence, "They like the tank really humid." but they don't like it soaking wet. It's hard to understand what that looks like. Uh, I talked about it on the, on our interview the other day is, you know, you want to miss the tank often, but in between mist cycles, the leaf litter and the ground layer, and even the plants, they should dry out and they shouldn't be sopping wet, soaking in algae and water and everything all the time. It's not how it's supposed to be. So that's kind of how you have to get dialed in there. Um, other first timer mistakes, leaving little gaps in the tank. I mean, I did that as a beginner. You know, my I built a tank, uh, uh, an aquarium, and I used an aquarium, a top opening tank, and I'd make it look what I thought was pretty at the time, which looking back is uh, comical. And uh, but the you know on an, an aquarium with a, a full glass lid, there's nowhere for air to go, so the tank would completely get covered in condensation, and I'd take like a little rubber spacer or something and I'd put it in front of the little lid on an aquarium that would tip up so I could get some airflow at the front of the tank so it wouldn't be condensation and I found a couple frogs dried up on the floor about 24 years ago um and I learned okay if you give them any sort of gap in a tank you just initially set up if they can get out they will get out um so those two things um not draining uh, a substrate, you know, not siphoning. You know, some people 
So you're out in the wild, I'm sure the, the ground gets saturated after a thunderstorm. It's fine if my ground's saturated. You know, talking about the wet substrate again, you want to have some way to drain. Um, so a drainage layer, uh, actual drain port in the tank drill that you can drain off water if it, if it gets too high. Um, something of the sort, you know, a, uh, a tube that you can stick in underneath the substrate and into the drainage layer and siphon that water out if need be. Those are things that are kind of important um, for the health of an animal. And lastly, I'll say, which we already talked about was vitamins and supplements. I had somebody a couple years ago tell me that they don't use vitamins or supplements with their frogs because it is just a ploy to for people to push their brand and make money off supplements for the from the hobbyists, which like and I just said to the person this was on and she she got mad at me and said I'm a I'm a jerk and I think I'm a know it all, which I really try not to be that at all. I always try and tell people you do what works for you. But when I see something that's completely wrong like this, I will speak up. Um, you know, she's she said. I don't use calcium. I don't use any. And I just was like, okay, I get it. And she's like, and I've had frogs for a while. And I'm like, okay, what's a while? And she said six months. <laughs> I was like, that's not a while. Uh, one, two, you're probably going to start seeing some issues in the next few months. If you're not using calcium and your frogs are not getting calcium, they're going to start having issues. You're going to start seeing their forearms start to be deformed. Their back, their back legs aren't going to be straight their back actually may start looking deformed. Like you're going to run into issues if you don't use supplements. I understand your, your thought thinking here on what you're saying, but it's just simply false and untrue. Calcium and several other vitamins are beneficial for these frogs and dare I say necessary for them. Um, so those would be things I would say as first time beginners, just thinking you can get some frogs and feed it fruit flies and not use vitamins or supplements. That's a, a pretty big one. All right, everybody, we're coming to the end of the, uh, the hour. So uh, go ahead and put whatever your last comments or questions are. And uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and do a quick round for the last questions here. Uh, <laughs> do you keep Bahia Solano? Very good, Bill. <laughs> Bahia Solana, yes, uh, that's Ufaga histrionica. Bahia Solana is what I call them. They've also been um, reclassified the, as uh, Ufaga solanensis. I, I don't, I don't get jiggy with that that verbiage, um, so I don't use that. I, I still call them the OG, but yes, I do keep them. Um, their care is different in terms of like dendrobates and phyllobates, but. Ufaga, it's all pretty much the same, um, and they are Ufaga species. So it's not like Bahia Solano are different than redheads or bullseye. Those are all Ufaga histrionica. Um, their care is going to be generally the same. they got to have bromeliads. All my frogs and species, everything behind me, all these tanks, just 33 tanks and, I don't know, five species and a bunch of different locales and morphs, they're all kept the same in terms of lighting, um, Misting schedules, humidity, ventilation, they're all kept the same. Besides the large obligates that do get the UVB, that's really the only difference between anything. Um, so husbandry in terms of that, like, you know, your basics and your parameters, the same. But plant choice for breeding, they've got to have tadpoles where dendrobates don't need tadpoles or don't need uh, bromeliads. Sorry, I misspoke there, but yeah. All right. Do you struggle with pests on your plants? If so, what do you do? I'm sure I do. I just don't know. <laughs> like uh, Mike, that tool was talking about thrips and some other stuff. And I'm like, what are thrips? He's like, ah, these little, I'm just like, I mean, I probably have them. I don't know. Um, I, I don't really get too into it. I just let the tanks kind of do their thing. If a plant dies and I, tr or if it's dying, I try to salvage it and I'll take a clipping and try and put it somewhere else to regrow and try and try it again later. Um, but I'd say the biggest pests I have are on bromeliads and scale. Scale is kind of a big pest of bromeliads, and that's the only one that really bothers me because if a um, relatively hard to breed histrionica is raising a tadpole in a certain leaf axle that's got tons of scale on it, and the tadpole mm -hmm. isn't fully developed, then that scale kills the leaf, and the leaf no longer holds water, and I have to try and intervene and hand raise the tadpole by putting the tadpole in a little cup of water, and I have to steal the eggs from other frogs and give them to that to try and raise it on my own 
and it's difficult and it's time consuming that I don't want to spend doing. So uh, I would say scale is the, is the big one for me. All right. Now we'll do this. The last one, you know, see noticeable benefits of sponge bottoms or is it a convenience thing? Uh, it's quite a few, um, quite a few things there. Um, benefit I would say is I don't ever have stinky drainage water. Um, I don't have really the, the, the drainage water is not dirty because I don't use substrate in those tanks. Um, it's literally just sponge mat and leaf litter over top of it and, or moss, but it's lightweight number one. Um, so without the use of substrate, I, I have started incorporating actual rock in my enclosure uh, where I don't need to, where you used to have to, if you were using substrate and drainage layer and all that, it added a ton of weight. So most people, if they wanted to use rock, they had to go spend a bunch of money and buy universal rock, um, which no no uh, knock on them. I think they make great products. I just, um, if I could buy sponge mat and not use substrate, then I could afford to, to use the weight of a real rock. Um, so, and I just like the look of the real rocks better, but um so that's a couple uh, things that are an advantage there. Um, other than that, if you do want to have a water feature, which aren't usually recommended for beginners, but if you want to have a water feature in your tank with your dart frogs, um, you don't have, again, you don't have dirty water. You don't have the really nasty, mucky water coming through because the sponge mat is actually filter sponge. It's used to filter things. So you're filtering that water, all the roots that grow into it, they filter the water as well. So you can have a, a water feature relatively easy with clean water um, where before with substrate and drainage layer, it was presented some challenges. Um, other than that, I, I don't see, um, it's not like more beneficial for you know, your microfauna than say your standard substrate. I wouldn't say it's an advantage or a disadvantage. It's kind of the same, but I love this stuff. Since I started using it, I haven't gone back. Okay. All right, Troy, we're coming to the end. Uh, any final words to all of these uh, intrepid new frog keepers? Because everybody from this interview is going to go out and get a dart frog. Because They should. I agree with you. I think everybody that has a community should have a dart frog. That's right. That's right. Um, so I will just say uh, the dart frog hobby is a wonderful hobby. And I and many others will welcome all of you. Uh, if I will tell you this, though, on social media, the hobbyist can be sort of nasty sometimes if you post something that goes against these unwritten rules. Um, <laughs> just try yeah, to tune them out. Don't. don't let them scare you away. Um, there are good people out there and good hobbyists out there, mainly who have been around for a long, long time, not two to five years. I'm talking 10, 20 years that are willing to help you and guide you the right way. So uh, I welcome you all and I hope you enjoy this wonderful hobby. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. I will be back tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. for the daily vlog that comes out seven days a week. And Sunday is always Meditation Sunday, and so we're going to be talking about uh, more of a philosophical issue that deals with us in the chameleon community and, and really the reptile community. And so if you uh, want to get up at 5 a.m. Pacific and hang out with me in the chat, I'm there live in the chat, but of course, you can watch it whenever you get up anytime after that. So, Troy, thank you so very much for joining us. Bill, thank you. We'll see you. Let's see. Hope hope to see more.